Hello, this is Al Black with Chewing the Gristle and my co-host, Tim Conroy. My brother Al, how you doing? It's great. Uh, the weather's great. I'm going to go out and vote right after this. And I encourage yes. all of you to vote. And our poet today is sitting up in beautiful Vermont. This is Sarah Dickinson Snyder. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I voted, by the way, just so you know, in the, in the mail ballot. Wonderful. With that, Sarah Dickinson Snyder has written poetry since she knew there was a form with conscious line breaks. She has three poetry collections, The Human Contract, 2017, Notes from a Nomad, nominated for the Massachusetts Books Award, 2018, and with a Polaroid camera from 2019. Recently, poems appeared in Rattle, the Sewanee Review, and Rhino. A 3030 poet for Tupelo Press, she was accepted both times she applied to the Bread Loaf Writers Conference. One poem was selected by Mass Poetry to be stenciled on the sidewalk. Another nominated for Best of Net 2017. So, we're really excited about this interview. Can you tell us about your poetry journey and who your mentors were and are today? Um, sure, yeah, I think <clears throat> um, I'll tell you the little story um, about wanting to be a poet kind of as soon as I saw this, this idea of writing looking different. Um, that you could, you know, create line breaks. And I, I really, I think it was in elementary school, I actually saw a poem and I, I, I don't know whether I told my parents then that I would be a poet, but it, it definitely, um, that's where the seed began, just visually seeing what poems look like on the page. And I'm, I'm a, um, I'm just crazy about fonts and actual writing. I, I don't know if you can see, I have a letterpress um, thing behind me, but so um, I, the visual aspect of poetry was really the the, the beckoning um, thing for me, the line breaks. So yeah, I started writing as a kid, and in college, I, I even thought I was going to leave college to go be, become a poet. And um, things happened, like I had to get a job, and I fell in love, and got some kids and became a mom and a teacher for, um, yeah, taught for 38 years. And so it wasn't until um, I turned 60 that I actually was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to be a poet full time. Um, and it just, I retired early. And yeah, I've been very lucky to have these three books published by small um, presses that I didn't think would ever happen. So everything that I'm receiving right now, um, I don't know if you guys have watched Ted Lasso. Have you guys seen that show on, on Apple TV? But he talks about falling out of a lucky tree and hitting every lucky branch on the way down. Sometimes that feels like my life. But yeah, I just feel very lucky right now that I can write full time, that I can send work out. And every, every, every now and again, somebody wants to publish it. So. That's wonderful. Tim. Sarah, describe for uh, us your poetry style. I feel like poems come to me. Like that's the, that I didn't, that basically it's almost like I'm a vehicle. And if I'm lucky enough to catch a poem coming through, I, it, it makes it on the page. And I, I consciously do that every day, write. So I write. I'm pretty disciplined about writing at least two hours a day. And sometimes that two hours turns into eight hours that I didn't know went by. And that's, that's, that's the, the luck and the joy of being retired that, um, you know, I do have things going on, but often I can just let my writing pull me into a place I didn't know I was going. And that's the best part when I think 
the discipline of, of sitting down and just writing and being open to surprise. That's, that's what I want to happen. And for things to, to emerge again, sort of like what I didn't know I knew comes out on the page. Um, that's when kind of like you feel like something magical might have happened. Yeah. So I'm, I'm fascinated by writing rituals. And so is, do you write with pen and pad? Do you write with a, a, a cup of hot tea next to you? How do you do it? Do you write on the porch? You know, where do you do it? And what are the rituals around it? Um, I am too, by the way, Tim. I'm, I love hearing about how people write. In fact, one of the, my husband and I were lucky enough to take a sabbatical in 2000 um, for six months. We took our kids out of school when they were nine and 10 and traveled around the world. Um, and by the way, we spent less money doing that than we would have had we stayed. It's just, we weren't, we were doing hostels and we weren't doing things with, um, you know, five-star hotels or anything. But I think, oh, what I was going to say is it doesn't matter to me the place where I write. Um, I, I do, you know, this is my, my room here in Vermont. And when the weather's nice, I am always out on the deck um, in a screened in porch where I can just, yeah, look outside. But, um, you know, I can write in my bed. And I'm always, I, I always have a journal like this. And it's a handmade journal. Um, and um, I don't know if you can see, but I, I always, you know, put something down the center of the page, just so um, I, I write in columns. I, I don't know, I just, they aren't really poems that I'm writing. But for me, I like to see them in that line break concept. Um, and then I can go back into them. And um, I probably have, I want to say 40 of these journals upstairs. Um, and I always use the same pen. And it's a, it's a micro, it's a micron 005. So I, I like a very fine point. And I, I cannot write without a fine point. So there, there are some <laughs> little things that I have to have. Um, and I, yes, I always have a cup of tea. Um, I drink, I know you drink tea too, Al. At least you have a title of your book about tea. Um, yeah, so I, and I write, like I said, at least two hours every day in this, in this. Um, and then I'll go from here to a computer and that's when I can play with it. Talk to us about um, the line break and what, um, is important for you and how you feel when it's right to make that break? That's such a good question. Um, and I, I, got, I guess I, I want to say, first of all, it's, it's just intuitive. That's, you know, when I'm just composing, it's just an intuitive thing. And as I'm working on the poem and revising it, then it becomes really um, a craft decision that, is a, that I'm affirming that initial decision or I'm making it change because I've missed an opportunity to create um, a cliffhanger or a, um, you know, a double meaning or a sound, the sound that I want. So, but it's funny, I just, I, I read so much poetry of others that I am always like one of my favorite poets. And I think she and I have a similar love of, of the short poem Kay Ryan, um, she does things with line break that I don't think you're supposed to do. Like, like I've read, like, don't ever end with like a, you know, or the, but she pulls it off in such a cool way that I've, I just try and look at people who are doing what I've been told not to do and figure out why they did it and what's working. And um, yeah, I, I do look at line break quite a bit. Um, and I want it, I actually want it to, because of my love of font and um, how things look on a page, which is one of the reasons why I love poetry so much is that no matter where you see a poem, it's always going to look the same, you know, whether it's on a billboard as you're driving by or whether it's just, you know, on a page, it, it, it's always going to look the same, which is just not true of prose. You know, it's, it's the actual um, whatever um, scaffolding, is, is, is going to look that way. And so for me, sometimes, like, for instance, I just um, read Jory Graham's um, poem called Thaw, 
I, I don't know if you've seen it or read it, but you know, she just, she's, first of all, she right aligned it, which I love. I don't understand. And I didn't know you could break that rule, but apparently you can. And then she just, she just like takes lines in and out. So it almost looks like tides and, you know, and I, and that's just not something that I'm familiar with, but I, I love it. And I, I want to learn from it and I want to try it and see if it might work with something I'm doing, but yeah, I'm, I'm always looking at other people's line breaks to go like, what are you doing and why are you doing that? Well, I think this would be a perfect time to hear some of your poems. If you would bless us with reading a few. Sure. I, could I start by reading on um, someone else's poem? This sure. is um, one of the things when I, um, when I left my teaching job um, as a teacher of high school and um, middle school English, after 25 years of being in that school, and I had worked in other schools, I, I really wanted the kids to understand that I wasn't leaving in any way, shape, or form because I didn't love teaching. Um, I was leaving because I had to follow something in me um, that was pulling me. And so I read this poem, and I think it, for me, it, it's still a poem that resonates um, in so many ways in terms of what, why you do what you do. And it's, Tim, just as we were talking before, just, you know, you, your, your passage in life that led to poetry, I think maybe could be, you know, you would find some meaning here as well. It's called The Way It Is by William Stafford. There's a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder about what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen. People get hurt or die. And you suffer and get old. Nothing you do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. And so oh, I love that. Sort of, it's such a great voice. Stafford has such a wonderful voice. Oh, yeah, and such a voice of, of authority but humility. You know, that, yeah, and... I think for me, it was so important for the students to understand that um, that I was just, I was being tugged by something, and it was just uh, a door that opened for me, and I was just like, I gotta follow this thread, you know. So, um, so I was gonna read a poem. I'll read a couple poems, like maybe two poems from um, this is my most recent book um, with a Polaroid camera, and it it's it's. Um, it basically follows the way a Polaroid image um, and film emerges. Um, I, I travel quite a bit. I've been lucky um, with my husband. We've taken students around the world many different times and places to many different countries. And um, we're doing service usually or, you know, some kind of um, sort of adventure, whether it's bicycling or hiking. And I always carry um, with me a Polaroid and, tons of film, like sometimes 400 <laughs> pieces of film. And then I, I give them to people that I meet there. So, and for some of these people, children especially, it's their only and first photograph of themselves. Um, so it's um, it just a, I, I'm, I keep thinking like, I may have been leaving a lot of trash around other countries. <laughs> you know, the, there's all of a sudden like all this Polaroid film that people are, you know, putting up on their walls or whatever. But anyway, um, so I love Polaroid film. I love the magic of it. As a kid, I loved, I had a Polaroid camera and I just, it was, it was magical. Um, and then as an adult, to be able to give this, these um, photographs to children around the world, it was, I just felt like a good thing. And so um, there's six chapters and they, they follow the process of loading the film, exposing that film to light, having the developing chemicals, that's the developing. And then when it comes out of the camera, it's still developing. And the way it develops is, is um, by the light hitting the, the paper and the film. And the first light that hits it is blue light, then green light, then red light. And that's how the, the color. And I actually got to interview um, the person who invented and developed color film for Polaroid um, while I was creating this book. So anyway, I'll read a couple and these are in the developing. I think they're in the developing. Yeah, this is in the developing section. 
a crash. Just the paper whites growing too tall, their heavy heads of fragrance and white bursts. That was the sound in the middle of the night, flowers toppling over, a seed in the ground, a bulb in the darkness, nothing really, just quiet growth below a surface, puncturing the dirt to find air and sun. How little nourishment is needed to stand tall and make noise. That's, so that's a poem, actually. Thank you. I, I sent this to, um, to the indolent press um, who's, you know, doing um, um, what Rough Beast, which is a, doing a poem every day um, ever since Trump was elected. And um, as this is a form of protest, just how little nourishment is needed to stand tall and make noise. Um, so that was great that they wanted to publish that. I'll read another kind of short one. Um, this is one of those poems where I, uh, I'll often say, you know, I, as a poet, I do lie. Um, and um, this lie that I'm doing right here is I'm giving one of my, something that, that I have a theory about to, to actual people who might have theories. But the lie, the lie is that it's actually my theory. One theory. Some students of migration believe that all life spawned from New Jersey that we began on exit and ex entrance ramps of the turnpike, nourished by the garden state, pecks of tomatoes and peaches my mother used to bring to Vermont in the summer, store them in the cool basement, an endless supply migrating north and south, vestiges of beaches, pine barrens, strip malls, leaving a home, echoes of where we were, what we miss, what we run from. When it comes to revision, when do you, how much do you revise? And when do you know that your poem is finished? <laughs> Never. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I think, um, you know, I'm still, I'm still playing with some of these poems that have been in a book. So yeah, I don't, I guess I, it's hard for me to let go of poems, but um, for me, I, I um like I said I I start in my journal and then I transfer to my computer where I can kind of manipulate line breaks and things like that in a pretty easy way. Um and then sometimes I'll go back to my journal if I want to expand an area. So it's, for me generating always happens in my journal. I guess that's what I my mind understands that I go in here to post, to explode or to allow my whatever is going on in my mind to um, pour on to a page. But the revision, I do a lot of revision on the computer. Um, and I'm it's so we're so lucky, right? Like I grew up when we didn't have that ability to shift everything, move one stanza up where, you know, start with the last stanza instead of the first. And I actually really love doing that. It feels at that point, it feels a lot like a puzzle and kind of I use that's when I can add some music that wasn't there. Um, by sound, you know, just, I can go to a rhyming dictionary and start putting in, yeah, so that's really fun, and that takes, who knows how long that happens for me, but I, I really depend on poetry workshops to help me kind of figure out, like, is this working really well, you know, and if it, if it's not, I, I get some feedback about where it's not, and then I can punch that out a bit and work on that part, or, but, I'll, I'll often use um, workshops to help me craft something into what I think is ready to send out into the world. Yeah. So within that, uh, do you have a particular poetry group that you participate in all the time or, or do you, uh, sign up for different workshops with festivals and individuals and how, how well, does that workshopping do uh, go for you? Well, it's interesting, Al, because it's changed dramatically since COVID um, in that I have, uh, so the place where my husband still works, the school where I, I retired from, my husband still works, which is in Bo outside of Boston. So we have a, 
a home on the property of the school, which we don't own. And then we have this house in Vermont. So I've had, I have writing groups in Boston, outside of Boston. I have them up here in Vermont. Um, and now, um, so I, we, I would meet in person, right? Um, but now I can meet them all, right? Who cares where you are? And I've taken workshops recently and at Breadloaf, actually, I, I met people there and we've created workshops that now we do online. And I just took a workshop with Ellen Bass and there were 12 of us in that workshop. And we've actually created another subgroup. You know, she, she was like, you guys work well together. You might want to think about sticking. And so I, I think I'm in, <laughs> this sounds obscene, but I think I'm in eight different workshops a week. I mean, they're not, some of them are every other week. But I, it's crazy how much poetry I do <laughs> with workshopping. So I've got to produce a lot of poems, like to, because they then tear them apart and rip them up and help me figure out what's, what line I can keep. And yeah, so I'm, I'm doing that. And I'm always looking for interesting workshops. I love Ellen Bath. So I, I took one of hers. I love Kim um, Adnanzio, Adnizio. And she, I took one with her recently. Um, and that's, I mean, again, this is the silver lining of what's going on in our world right now that that we can, you can join a, a workshop really easily now. You don't have to fly across the country. It doesn't cost as much, you know, like, and all of a sudden you're Zooming with poetry. So like this, this is, you know, like. Who are you of, reading right now? And, and what and who is influencing what you're writing? Everybody influences what I write. I, I loved I love poetry. And in fact, every day in my email, I get, uh, do I get four? No, I get three poems a day, you know, whether that's from poetry.org or, you know, Poetry Foundation. Um, so I'm reading every three, at least in the morning before I start exercising. <laughs> I read three poems. And then um, I just bought um, Lucille Clifton's newest collection. It's a, you know, a, a selected poems. It's just unbelievable. I love her. She's one of my favorite poets, really. Um, and I just bought, and I haven't gotten it yet, but I'm really looking forward to Even Boland's um, newest collection. She, she died earlier this year, but she had a collection that was coming out. So um, she is one of my, my she's, she's a woman that, that inspires me the most, I think. Her, her work is just, like, gorgeous and I think I write a lot about mothering and she does too. Um, so that's really an affirmation of, of that. Um, I am, like I said, I'm a Kay Ryan. I have many of her books. Um, you know, just the fact that um, Louise Glick just became, you know, Nobel Prize winner. Um, I have gone back. I've got a couple of her books that I hadn't read, Wild Iris, I hadn't read in a while. And um, she's very inspirational to me as well. Um, yeah, I'm always I'm always reading poems. I think one of the people who's affected me so powerfully recently is um, Ocean Vuong, and um, I have his poetry book. But I I recently read his prose slash poetry. It's it's poetry, but um, he's he's an amazing poet, and uh, it's aspirational for me to read him. Just the the courage that he has. Yeah, I think his bravery as a poet is is what I want. And I don't know if I can, I can get there as in my stage of life. I don't know if I can be as brave as he is, but I heard him speak um, in Woodstock, Vermont. Um, was it last summer? I think it, it wasn't this past summer, obviously, but I think it was the summer before he was at an event and hearing him speak aloud um, was, I felt like I just needed to have my journal out and write down everything he said because it was so interesting and powerful. Share with us a couple more poems. Okay. I'll share with you um, a poem that just got taken. It hasn't been published yet, but it's going to be in their, their um, next um, their next um, issue by Rhino. Um, this is a poem that that was started <laughs> in Ellen Bass's workshop in um, in July, and 
it's, it was started because Ellen, I don't know if you know her, her work, but it's, she just, she writes, I just love her work. And she was just talking to this group of 12 people. And she said, you know, like poems can come from anywhere. Like I, I just opened my drawer the other day and I found like this lacquered uh, wishbone. Um, and I her her saying that just pulled me into thinking about wishbones. Like, and this is, I started this poem in that workshop and then I've revised it, I wanna say hundreds of times. Um, and this is what it's ended up to be. And by the way, I love The Odyssey. It's um, probably one of my favorite books, yeah. I sort of look at it as the first novel poem, <laughs> whatever. So it's called Entering the Odyssey. I like thinking of Penelope, watching her weave and unweave, maybe see Athena slip into her room, hover over the bed built into a tree, ease her into dream, see the stone ledge of her window lined with a white tipped feather, milky curves of shells and small bones like something on our kitchen sill, a wishbone among the dust and keys and curled rubber bands, the furcula, what a bird needs to pull its wings up and down. My mother dried it in the sun, the arched V reminding me of the skeletal remains of a tiny angel's cast off wings, where it awaited the breaking and the wish granting, the weight of waiting, of anticipating who gets the larger part, my small index finger being brave, willing to have a wish unmet. So much in what vanishes, too much to count. Who has more cherry pits in the bottom of her bowl? Who gets the paper ring of a grandfather's cigar? Who holds her breath the longest in that under world of water? Will we ever get what we want? Maybe all hopes arrive in disguise like an old beggar. That's great. Thank you. Yeah. But it's so funny that that that's when I think about poems sort of being out there and being open to them and allowing them to enter you. You know, for me, it's, it's really hearing that word wishbone and just letting it become into me. And then when I go to write to kind of remember, yeah, it's, to me, it feels a lot like catching poems. Do you have one more? Sure, I'll read another one. Um, this is um, this is a poem called "My 27-Year-Old Daughter Back Home for a Year." I doubt she'll return the things she's taken: a lipstick, tweezers, a necklace. I'm not too mad, except maybe in the moment when I'm in the shower, leg lathered reach for the razor I'd left on the lip of the tub. I might swear when it's not there. Wish she'd returned it or had hung up my new sweater slouched on the shelf she must have tried on and discarded. I hear the slap of the screen door. Now she's in my car, knows there's gum in there. It's as if everything I have is hers. She takes from me, leaves some behind. The way I'd reach into my father's jar of change for quarters, dimes and nickels, left the pennies. She'll leave again, all my things back in place. I'll sit in the evening, dark wine in a glass, my mother's ring loose on my finger. I love that. Mm -hmm. Great line at the end. Thank you. Tied it all together. Thank you. Tim. No, this is a question, Sarah, I've asked often in this series. Um, what advice do you give to the emerging poet about working through mediocrity, the frustration of the hours spent to get better, and then sending poems off that are not accepted and then still working? Um, what advice do you give to that persistent emerging poet? Well, I feel like I'm still there in many ways. Um, yeah, I, I, it's funny. I, I don't think, I don't think I'll ever not feel like an emerging poet, you know, 
trying to send her a workout and, and move into something else. But um, I guess my advice is that you, that you shouldn't do it unless you feel like you have to, that if it's not something where you, you're excited about waking up in the morning and, and working on it and finding out things. And, you know, for me, you know, the, when I came to the wishbone, it immediately pulled me into Wikipedia to find out more about the wishbone and what it, what it really does. And I didn't know the word furcula and I, you know what I mean? Like I, it's something um, that if it's not doing that for you, then it's probably not, you know, feel free to keep doing it, but you know, you're going to get crushed by the rejection. So it's got to be something, it, it's got to be the thing that you're doing that brings you joy and not the publishing and not anything else that it has to be, you know, after I, every Monday I do a generative um, workshop with some friends and we just, after, after two hours of, of just creating and sharing and creating and sharing, creating and sharing, I look at them and I go, this is the funnest thing I've ever done. Every single Monday, I, I feel that way. I'm like, oh my God, I just dived into this writing and I, I don't know where it came from. And, um, you know, for me as a teacher, I would do this with my students. And I mean, I have to tell you, there's nothing better to me as a teacher than to watch their little hands doing whatever they're doing and just going at it and then we sit back and we share and to hear everybody has a completely different thing and we all have the same prompt and there's there's something magical about that to me that we all dive into something we all have a story and if if, if your story is something that you love doing and diving into and then you're in the right place but if you're if you're like, oh, shoot, I didn't get published. I mean, I, I love getting published. I think that's super fun. And I feel very happy when it happens, the, you know, the rare times that it does. But as soon as I get a rejection, I'm like, okay, you didn't like that? I'm going to try somebody else. So I don't know. I have, I have the, I, I must write. I just must write. I don't know why, but I must write. So Let's and talk um, a little bit about the poetic elements that you tend to use and the elements that you tend to avoid. My, my biggest trick that I do is I go and find language I love either in work that, I, that isn't a poem yet, something just like a phrase. And what I do, let me see if I can find you, if I can show this to you. Like if you, if you look on the very top of every page, there's, there's just some things. They're like little phrases or whatever. And it's, it's, it's my way of tricking my brain into going someplace I hadn't expected. So I, I kind of have a rule that I have to use those things in some way. Um, and Ellen Bass actually um, in her workshop does a similar thing where she, she takes like 10 single words of, you should just open a book of somebody's poetry and just take 10 words from a multiple poem and she has to use them. And it pulls, it pulls you into that surprise um, that you're really hoping to find on the page. Um, you know, it's Robert Frost said, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. And that's what, I, I think that's my whole craft. You know, like I want to surprise myself. And if I'm not surprised, I'm not moving anything interesting. You know, like if I haven't been surprised by what pops, who nobody else is going to be surprised by it either. So that's my initial way of going like, I'm going to hunt for something that's interesting is I must surprise myself. I use, I mean, this is, a, this is kind of a goofy thing too, but oftentimes I'll use these two. These are um, paint chips. And I, I, I've gotten tons of use out of this thing. It was like a, ten dollar investment I think or something but you know these are like just these little colors and I I often will just stack them around me and I have to use like two of them like that's my rule or something or I have to so I've, I I also use a timer so I have like you know like 15 minutes boom I've got to write for that long and it's got to be can't stop writing you know I push myself to do these are all like tricks I use to 
get the right stuff on the page that then I can go play with. Then the craft is, is really about, yeah, music, like trying to get um, sounds. I, I love assonance. So I'm always trying to find if one, you know, if one line down, you know, I'm always looking to see if I have some kind of, some form of assonance that I've rhymed the vowel sounds with something in the line before it. Um, I am always looking for, as I said, interesting line breaks. So I want to say everything should be conscious that I do on the page. So I consciously say like, what's going to make this pop? What's going to make this interesting? What might have a double meaning? What might, so I'm making that choice as I'm craft using craft. I'm not a huge um, um, form poem person, but I don't mind them. I, I just, I don't lean toward form. Um, and I certainly don't lean toward um, a rhyme scheme. I don't mind rhyme at all. In fact, I love rhyme, but I don't, I'm not a scheme person as much. But every now and again, I'll make myself write sonnets or uh, villanelles or things like that just to push myself to do it and to see what's happening. What, and then I'll often deconstruct it and use the, the language, whatever the form helped me do, um, I will then probably not use it, you know, but I'll, I'll use some of the lines that it helped me create. I'm, I am a huge person who believes that form can create creativity, you know, that, that, that it's not a restriction, that it actually can, can um, blossom creativity. But I, I steal a lot too. I, I steal a lot of ideas and language and, yeah, I, you know, great writers, I mean, good writers borrow, great writers steal, that's, I think, T.S. Eliot's line. Um, <clears throat> and if I do it too much, I'll, I'll definitely cite it, you know, if I'm going to, or, or epigraph, you know, give somebody credit, but um, yeah, is that enough? Or Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, Brother Al? This one uh, increases my library. I always uh, ask, what resources do you use or do you recommend to poets? Uh, you know, who do you read or, or what is your resource or what is one of the resources that helps you become a better poet? Yeah, I'm, I've, while I wasn't consciously, you know, like sending work out and, uh, you know, before I turned 60, I, I, I I don't think I had published any poems before that um, or very few, but I was always reading poetry. I mean, from, from the day, as I said, that line break concept for me came, I was, I was in, I, w I wanted to read poetry. So I think I have this, you know, wave of, you know, reading, whether it's, you know, um, Keats or Yeats or, you know, just poets from before and Eliot and I, I love reading poetry um, from the past and understanding it and understanding how it changed and, you know, why we're not using as much rhyme now and just sorts of things like that. Like I've, I've been immersed in poetry. Um, but, you know, I think, um, like books like, uh, was it Word by Word by Annie Lamont, like who are just, uh, just writers. I, I love writer's advice. Uh, like Stephen King has a book on writing that I really like. Um, Tim O'Brien is a great book on writing. So, and, it, and it, to me, is writing is writing, whether it's prose or poetry. Um, I just want to find out what people, you know, what they do and how they do it. Um, so, yeah, I just keep exploring that. Like, but there isn't, I don't, I'm trying to think, I don't really have a text that I would say, this has been really helpful for me, a resource. But I think reading poetry, reading other people's poetry is really, really important. The person that I'm going to dive into um, in a big way very soon is Walt Whitman. I just sort of feel like I need to understand him more. And again, maybe it's that Jory Graham long line concept that I don't have, that I'm, I'm wondering why I don't do that, like, and why they did. So. Tim. Um, Sarah, how about read two more poems for us before we wrap up? Okay. Um, so again, my, a lot of my poems do have to do with travel just because I've been so lucky to do that. So I'm going to read a couple poems that um, are about traveling and 
yaks in Tibet. The tail is tufted on the end. It's sold in India as a fly swatter. Buddhists here must kill to endure the winter rising. Every part a source for more. The skins are bags and clothes and boats. The long hair becomes rope. The hooves are filled with protein and the meat eaten, dried, salted, or raw off the bone. The head, the head is given as a gift. Mm. Well, and thank you. And I'll, I'll read the, the title poem. It's called um, With a Polaroid Camera. One click let light in, a brief exposure of a child's face, a blank white rectangle slid out, the developing chemicals reacting below the glossy surface, darkness emerged first, muted and vague, defining the borders, gathering dimensions, nose, eyes, mouth. All of the images now tacked or leaning against a mud wall between the pages of a grandmother's Bible or warming a pocket, 400 bordered faces there somewhere. That's awesome. What pro what's your next project? I am, I have another manuscript that I'm, I'm kind of um, tweaking and figuring out if it's going to go anywhere. So I'll probably work on, I'm working on that, but you know, for me, it's, I always just I'm continually surprised by how how motivated I am inside of me to just write brave with braveness with bravery and I that's my next project is to write a brave poem and I want to keep doing that I want to keep being brave in my poetry Where can folks get your your uh, poetry Um they can certainly look on my website um, that, that both I've linked to, to all three books, how to get them. The two, two of the books, um, The Human Contract and Notes from a Nomad are on Amazon. Um, and then this most recent book, um, the publisher Main Street Rag, um, it, they don't link to Amazon for probably good reasons. Um, so you can get it right from the Main Street Rag um, website and I have a link for that on my website as well so, or you could actually write to me and I can send you one too so we've really enjoyed your your poetry your interview and we want to thank you for being part of this series chewing the gristle and we want to encourage folks to subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, with chewing the gristle so thank you again Sarah Dickinson Snyder. Well, thank you guys. I, um, again, I am honored and um, yeah, I feel very lucky to have met both of you. And I just, I'm so grateful that you wanted to talk to me about poetry. Like I'm just a little person up here in Vermont writing away, scribbling in her book. And I feel just grateful that you guys wanted to talk with me. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>